Oh, it's, it's good to mess up sometimes, isn't it? Because then it kind of gets you out of the, you know, just saying it without thinking about it, right? Uh, not that, it, that that was what was happening with her, but it's like what happens to us. We also go, whoa, yeah, what are we saying, right? So, yeah. It always helps me to know how to think about mess-ups, right? So, yeah, God uses even those kinds of times in our lives. Well, man, I have enjoyed so much the last two weeks when we had these special speakers here. <laughs> I, could, I mean, you know, Chen Sisi from Malawi, wasn't that awesome when he spoke to us? Right? Just so excellent. So, so when he sees us online, yay, Chen Sisi, we are so glad you were here with us. And then Chris Goff last week. Uh, how powerful, what a good, resonating, like, truth uh, out of 1 John, Simply Gospel. Very, very good, man. I'm so grateful, so grateful for what God is, is teaching us. Um, so are you ready again? Let's jump into this. Simply Gospel. As we talk about uh, the text today from uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 19, uh, very, very powerful, powerful words. All right, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word today? And um, and there, there's just a number of different versions. I just wanted, to, I would really like to take time just to read all, all of them to you because they're, they're, they're just uh, nuanced in certain ways, have some great truths to them. But the, I'm just choosing today out of the new uh, international version just to, to read you this text. And what I'm going to do today is at some places in the text, the reading of the scriptures today, I'm just going to uh, say these words. Repeat after me, okay? And then I'm going to let you repeat a portion with me, and then, and then I'll just read on, okay? And we'll do that a, a few times in this text. God's word reads like this. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So repeat after me. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world. That we might live through him. him. Amen. It's a good word, isn't it? This is love. Not that we love God. But that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Say this with me. Dear friends, since God so loved us. us, We also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, Holy Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So repeat after me. If anyone, acknowledges that, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not yet made perfect in love. Repeat after me the final verse. We love because he first loved us. Amen. Amen. God's word. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm astounded by the simplicity of the words and yet the power, the the penetrating power of the clear word of God regarding 
who we are in Christ, how we are loved, how we are to let that love flow into the lives of other people, what we are called to do, how we are called to be in this world. If you ever come to any confusion about that, just go to a verse like this and just sit before it and invite the Holy Spirit of God to actualize it in your life, to integrate the whole of your life around these powerful, regenerating, life-giving words. God is love. Love comes from God. Love is defined by God in Jesus, his son. Whoever is born of God loves and knows God. Since God has loved us, it is the rightful flow of things unhindered that we are to love one another in the same way that he loved us. At this point, I want to say, okay, what, next, next, just keep reading. And I realize that, no, this is, this is where God wants to park us. This is where God wants to go deep in us. You know, some people believe that being made a deep, uh, to be made deep in your faith, to be made a deep Christian, a deep follower of Jesus is to accumulate knowledge, to know all of the fascinating facts of the Bible. And by the way, it is fascinating. But a person goes no deeper in their relationship with God than radical obedience takes them. Profound, personal, radical obedience to the revealed will of God in Jesus Christ is what deepens one's life in God. Amen? Knowledge puffs up, Paul said to the Corinthians, but love builds up. We should indeed have knowledge. We should increase in our knowledge. We should, we should take, take it all in. But we are not just simply to jump from knowledge to knowledge to knowledge to knowledge. We are to go from knowledge to fruit bearing. We are to go from knowledge to obedience. These words reveal to us how much growth we have yet to have in Jesus Christ, right? Lord, do these words in us. Do these word in, words in us. And his love is made complete in us by the practice of loving one another as Jesus has loved us. We're coming to uh, Holy Week, we're coming to Good Friday, we're coming to Easter. And so it's appropriate that also in the midst of that we understand that the heart of this love comes from the person of Jesus Christ. So it's not about, it's not about loving as I understand love. It's not about m me doing the best that I can do in regard to love. It's, it's not about my own, you know, uh, definition and my own energy into love. It is about what God has shown me and shown to us in Jesus Christ. So three times in this passage, the scripture mentions, John mentions to us clearly that God sent his son. That is so disappointing to want to sneeze and not be able to. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just hate that. That's just like an unfulfilled dream, right? People that are listening to this will have no idea what just happened. Three times he mentions this. God sent his son. This, and notice the threefold gift in that. Verse 9. God showed his love among us. In other words, he demonstrated. He, he manifested his love. Just, there's something about the manifestation of love. 
You know, it's not words, 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 talk, talk, talk. It's manifestation. It is show me. And he says, I have shown you. So this love is manifested to us in this way, among us in this way. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And in all three of these instances that we're going to mention, there is something that happens because God did this. God is love. God has shown his love by sending his son. And it, it, it unleashes, it, it releases something powerful into our lives. Right here in verse 9, that we might live through him. This is, this is astonishing. We live because God is loved in Jesus Christ. Through Christ, we live. We live in him. That we might live. Now, we were dead apart from him. We were dead. We were not partly alive. We were dead. This is how Christ found us. <laughs> we were dead in our sins. We, we were dead in our disconnection from God. We might have had all the best intentions in the world. We might be, uh, we might be succeeding very well in this uh, independent, prideful life, you know, or a self-contrived life, or we may be floundering and struggling. But the point is, whether we appear alive or we appear dead, we were dead in our sins apart from Jesus Christ. And God sent his son into the world. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Oh my, I just love this. So just again, simply gospel is simply Jesus. Simply Jesus. That we might live in him. In fact, chapter 5, verses 11 through 12 will underscore this. This is the testimony that God has given us his son. And in his son, there is life, eternal life. He who has the son has life. And the one who does not have the son of God does not have life. It's simply Jesus. It's all connected right in this person of Jesus. It's not connected in the doctrine of Jesus. It's not connected in beliefs about Jesus. It's connected in the person of Jesus Christ. A living union, a relationship with Jesus Christ that releases life into our lifelessness. So don't ever confuse us with believing the right things. It is important to believe the right things. It is, it is very important to believe the right things. But believing the right things does not release life into you. It is embracing the person of Jesus Christ. So he becomes the primary influencer of your life. He is the source of your life. He has the supremacy in all things. In him all things hold together. He is your life. All right? So we end up worshiping Jesus because he is the subject of our affections. Not because we're checking off worship on a to-do list. We follow him in obedience because where else could we go? You have the words of life. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's you. It is you, Lord. It becomes highly personal. It becomes like, yeah. It's, it's you and Jesus and it's us and Jesus together. It's, it's him. He, is, he has come, demonstrated love so that we might live. So that we, he, God wants us to live. God wants us to come alive. And only God and Jesus can do that. Second. Verse 10, second use of this. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So here it is. He loved us. He sent us. This is love, right? This is love. Not that we loved God. So we don't have any understanding of what love is by our effort to love God. We understand what love is by God's decision and the way he went about loving us. This is our understanding of love now. <laughs> it's radical. It's crazy. It is reckless love. And he sent his son, not only that we might live, but he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is huge, right? The self-sacrifice, this is love. The self-sacrificing, self-emptying, self-offering Jesus. The Jesus who immerses himself, descends into our, our mess, <laughs> identifies with us in our mess. He is numbered, as Isaiah 53 says, he was numbered with the transgressors. That's us. He was numbered with them. He's, he, he's, in, the, he's in the lineup, you know. Name your name, name your name, name your name. And there's Jesus 
lined up in the lineup. He is numbered with us, with transgressors. Totally vulnerable, totally emptying himself. This is love. This is what you know what love is, right? Love is not a token, a little uh, patronizing. Loving other people is not like being nice to them on occasion, you know, and say, well, good, I loved. Got that over with, right? But like this, he immerses himself to be the sacrifice for our sins, to restore the relationship, to absorb all that is wrong within us, to exchange it for all that is whole in him. Verse 14, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son, and here's the next thing, to be the Savior of the world. That's just a beautiful picture, right, in this, in this triad of giftedness. To be the Savior of the world, to restore the Savior, to heal, to deliver us from and to deliver us into something. To deliver us from evil and to deliver us into life. To deliver us from ourselves, <laughs> our self-idolatry and to deliver us into life in his son and he is at this very moment saving us by his life and he leads the resurrection parade i like it i like parades i like parades i i i really like parades that that uh that people i love are in right and so i love this parade because you're in the parade right this resurrection parade he is saving the world. You know what Jesus is up to in the world? Jesus is not present in the world. Listen, listen. There's a lot wrong with the world. Jesus is not present in the world condemning the world. Did you know that? Jesus is not at this moment present in the world condemning the world. Did you know that? He is not at this moment in the world condemning the world. He is loving the world, laying down his life for the world with the goal of healing the world. He has a plan for humanity he desires to restore. This, this simply, just simply Jesus. I know it's not all that simple because it really creates a lot of conflict within us. But simply Jesus simply gospel he sent his son into the world as a demonstration of what love is and calls us to be like this so what that sets up this so what is God doing in the world right what he is doing in the world is that he is helping us know how to live like we have seen in Jesus Christ so that in the end we know him and we love like him, and we know, and we rely on the love of God. Verse 16, we love, we know, and we rely on the love that God has for us. We know and rely. This love is so powerful. In Jesus, when you see the love that God has for you in Jesus, you are, something begins to happen. You are, when you embrace Christ, there's something of new life. You, you begin to be regenerated. The new life starts happening. You come alive. And one of the things you come alive to is the realization that you don't have to live life all by yourself. You don't have to live life relying on your, yourself. You can rely upon him. The actual text says we know, which means that we have this personal experiential knowledge of him. We actually know. We actually know him. We're not just knowing about him. Don't ever confuse knowing about him with knowing him. You, we know him. So if we hear a voice that doesn't sound like him, we go, that doesn't sound like Jesus. Because <laughs> we know him, right? His sheep know his voice, right? So we know him. And we, and we rely upon him. And the word for rely is the word for believe. Oftentimes translated believe or faith. Here it's translated we rely on this love, which is a good, accurate sense of the word. In the Old Testament, the word trust meant to put the full weight of your life down upon something, to trust it, right? So you put the full weight of your life down upon God. We know and we rely. We can rely on this love. This, I, how, is this going to be failing love? This is not going to be failing love. It's God's love for the first part. God sent his son, secondly, and this son was faithful completely to the end, absorbing all of our sins, taking all of our pain, taking all of our punishment, taking everything that was due to us in our separation from God, and has fully restored us back to God. He's not going to drop the ball now. Um, I was thinking about 
uh, this putting, relying, putting the full weight upon I had, So I have this picture, right? Remember when your kids are little and you're, and uh, at first, you know, you carry them to bed, right? You're carrying them to bed. And then sometimes, like as a dad, or I'd say, hey, hop on my back. Come on, I'll take you to bed, right? You remember? Anybody have that fun with your kids? Hop on my back. I'll take you to bed, right? So I used to do that for a while. Well, here, here's really funny. My wife's not here. She's uh, visiting our, our, some of our kids in Boise. And, uh, but uh, Lynette, <laughs> so our boys, when they're in high school, they, they would say, now you know our boys, right? Some of you, right? And uh, Chris is a little heftier of the two. Um, and uh, so anyway, they would say, hey, Mom, carry us to bed. <laughs> so Lynette would say, Okay. So she'd go like this, and those high school boys, one at a time, would uh, just jump on her back, and she would take them to bed, right? And she would dump them over in bed and everything. Oh, it's just funny as all get out. But, but here, here's the thing I want to say, is that um, don't ever think that you can outgrow the ability of God to carry you. Right? So... So today is uh, my grandson Elijah's 16th birthday. But many of you remember that 16 years ago today, we received word that he had a malformed heart and, that, and we know that by the time he was three, he had a heart procedure through the back and, uh, and, and two open heart surgeries. And we rejoice today that he's 16. But I will tell you, we weren't sure that he would reach 16. And I remember standing with uh, my son, Chris, in the hallway outside the, the birthing room, just receiving this news, knowing that he needed to be transported to uh, NICU at Tacoma General, and standing there, and Chris is saying, what, what happened? He said, I'm, I'm healthy. My wife's healthy. How, we're, how, how did this happen? How, how did this happen, right? And being a guy in the, of biology and physiology and anatomy and all he just like is trying to like rat and a man of faith trying to wrap his and you know what had to happen at that point he had to jump on God's back and rely on God's love and every time you have to jump on God's back and rely on God's love over something really hard over something really difficult it is like rediscovering the stability of God all over again Right? We know and we rely on. Don't think you're ever going to be finished with this. You're not, you're not finished with this lesson. <laughs> For our whole lives, we are called to know and rely on the love of God. And if you know this love that was given to us in Christ, then you can. You can rely upon this love. You can put the full weight of your messed up, struggling, <laughs> complex, mysterious life. You can set the whole thing upon Christ. And trust his love. Trust his love. You see, what's important to understand is that when we ask, what is God doing with this? Well, God is making us like himself. God is making us like Jesus. And, and with regard to his death and all that, I just want to say that Jesus didn't die on the cross for us just to balance the ledger. You know, have all this debt against God, all this sin, all this debt I owe God. And so Jesus comes and dies for my sins and balances the ledger so that, so that we're good now. That's not, that's not all that forgiveness means. Let me just, let me, let me explain it in this way. It's, it's, remember how sometimes, so, so as a man, okay, so um, sometimes uh, we want to, you know, ask for forgiveness, and then we want to say, are we good now? You ever been there? Let me paint it a little more like this. Um, you know, is, is everything balanced out? I sin uh, against you, Lynette. I incur a debt. Uh, you are hurt and distanced uh, from me. I feel bad. I ask you for forgiveness. You forgive. Now, are we good to go? Like, is it balanced? Is it balanced out now? And what I learned from this whole example of Jesus 
that no sin forgiven should ever put us back just to where we were before the sin. In other words, it's not just about balancing things out. See, this is like, look, God's not a bookkeeper. <laughs> he is a father, <laughs> right? It's not, a, it's not a matter of balancing the, the ledger, right? It's not a matter of having a balanced budget, you know? God's grace and I have withdrawals. Whoop, over withdrew. Okay, are we good now? No, it's, it's, he, it's in a relationship. So no sin confessed and forgiven should ever put us simply back to where we were before the sin. Every sin forgiven should place us significantly deeper in the relationship. More loving, more humble, more grateful, more soft, right? So that forgiveness given and forgiveness received tills the hardness of our heart so that God fathers us into greater capacity to love. Is this making sense? Because this is a misunderstanding that a lot of people have about their salvation. They think, hey, man, you know, ask Jesus into my heart, you know, we're, we're good, we're good. It's all balanced out. They think about only in terms of past sins, not in terms of the relationship that God has called us into in Jesus Christ. Man, and when we think in terms of the relationship, just just like, Oh my goodness, it changes everything so much. God is not merely fathering children into existence. He is fathering us into his fullness. Hey, I'm not a good father. If I um, bring about children in the world through my wife, if I brought out one child into the world through Lynette, and say, I'm a good father, not the case. A good father is not revealed in the ability to produce children. A good father is revealed in the fathering. Do you understand? In the fathering of children. So God is a good father. So he doesn't just father a bunch of children into the world, i.e. us. He doesn't just father us into the world and say, I'm a good father. Got that done, right? Pretty prolific, huh? No, not so much. He's a good father because he fathers us into his fullness. It's so important to understand. Man, when I preached about three weeks ago and taught on being fathered by God, it just started changing. I've been a Christian a long time. It just started changing the way my prayers happen. I, I, just, I, I looked at my, at my week ahead, and I knew I had some really hard meetings, and I had a hard week, and I had a really demanding thing, and some things I really didn't want to have to do that I needed to do, you know, and I began, to, instead of saying, God, help me through this, you know, which is, was my prayer a lot, but it became more, more, much more personal. I began to just say, oh, God, would you, would you Abba, Abba. Would you father me into my identity today? Would you father me into my own belovedness? Would you help me not forget who I am? Would you father me by increasing my capacity to love? Would you, would you father me into greater patience and greater understanding and, and, and greater tenderness? Would you father me into this, right? Would you, would you father me into, into more... Um, I'm even praying that about fasting, right? I said, God, would you father me into this? Because, man, sometimes I feel like I just like, ah. I don't, I don't even know how to interpret that word, ah, right? But you know what I'm talking about. So, but here's the great thing. He, he's not a one and done God. He doesn't say, you're here. It's more like he fathers us into his fullness, Man, I just, I just want to tell you, you have a father like that. Isn't that awesome? You have an amazing God like that. Father me into this. Father me into this. Okay, I'm trying to think about what to do with the last five minutes. So I'll skip to this. Because Jesus has loved us, we are to love one another. Let me ask you a question. What reason do you need to love people that are hard to love? What, what reason do you need? Do you need them to give you a reason? 
You give, me, give me one good reason to love you. Well, God, they, nobody has to give you a good reason to love them. Jesus has given you the reason. Verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. It's causal. He first loved us, we love. It's so important. I'm reading uh, kind of the story of St. Francis of Assisi and and uh, there's one episode in which he was, um, in which he was um, on his horse, and he was, he was uh, striding down this road uh, pathway, and uh, coming toward him was a, a fear of all fears. A leper, a leper was coming toward him, shining his white and horrible, decayed skin in the sunlight. Great fear from within him. But because God had been working in his life around the person of Jesus, all of a sudden, in, 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 in the midst of, of the long rush of his life, his soul must have stood still. And he sprang off of his horse, knowing nothing between stillness and swiftness, as one writer put it. And he rushed on the leper and threw his arms around him. And it was the beginning of a long vocation of ministry among many lepers. The leper himself provided no reason to be loved. But Jesus of Nazareth provided more than enough reason to love. We said over lunch yesterday with Chris, I mean last Sunday with Chris Goff, Lynette and me, and uh, we, just, we just talked about this and, and perhaps, perhaps we can say, Perhaps it is we who need the poor, not they who need us. Perhaps it is we who need the homeless, the mentally ill. Perhaps it is we who need them to draw us into the experience of actually having to learn to love with Jesus. For as long as we are only loving those who love us or who are like us, if we are only doing that kind of love, then we are only repeating our own version of love. But when we are called to love people who are not like us, which, by the way, we are called to do, then we will have to know and rely upon the love that God has shown to us. And my prayer is that we'd be such a radically loving place that we would create an environment where two things happen. And maybe a third. An environment where we are changed. An environment where others are loved and begin to be open to whatever change God wants to bring to them. And third, that we would become such a place that God would trust us with all the people that need this kind of love. Amen? Here in his love, simply Jesus. How should we love? Simply Jesus. How far should we love? Simply Jesus. But when if we don't feel like loving? Simply Jesus, the atoning sacrifice for our lovelessness. Amen. I will tell you this. Simply gospel, simply Jesus is the truth that transforms lives. Beginning here. Whoo. Wow. I don't want the Jesus that politicians turn him into. I don't want the Jesus that religious leaders turn him into. I don't want the Jesus that my own imagination turns him into. I want and I need and we need the Jesus that God the Father gave us. Father, S 
let the, uh, the atoning sacrifice flow for us and flow over us. Do a work in us. I just want to ask you if, if you want to be fathered by God in this, would you? And I, I, I mean, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you very specifically, so, or if you just like find a hunger in you for this and you want to be fathered by God into this, just, uh, you know, raise your hand, man, or stand. Say, that's me, whatever you want. That's me. I want to be fathered into this. Amen? Be fathered into this. Yeah, God, do this in us. Just, just work this in us, Lord. Just give us a soft background. It says in the scripture here that God, we, we know that we, we, we are of him because he has given us his spirit. Amen? Do you know all these things that he desires to be in us are created by the real presence of the spirit of Jesus given to us. So he's able to make you alive to this by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. So, yeah, Father, thank you. Just uh, flow over us with these truths. God, deliver us from the sin of forgetfulness because there's a high chance if we follow our normal pattern, we're going to walk out of here and we're going to forget what we just looked at. Help us not to forget what we have seen, what we've heard, what you've spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think we're just going to let the, the team kind of sing this next song. And why don't you just uh, stand up and uh, you can sort of do this, right? You can come and pray. You can, uh, you can uh, turn and bless somebody next to you with truth. You can, uh, you can leave. You can... Uh, yeah, just let their heart response, heart response to God, okay? But the service is over, uh, except for where God still is working in your heart at this moment. So God be with you. And as he's saying, again, feel free, come and pray. Pray for one another. You might turn to somebody and say, would you pray for me about this? That's good confession, right? You can do that. And uh, anyway, so glad you came today. Uh, may you, uh, may, may you be, uh, wonderfully agitated by the truth. May we all be changed. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you.